Well, hey, church family, I'm so glad you've joined me today. We are going to finish up our study of the book of Philippians today, and uh, so let's just get right into it. Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 to 19, and it says this, is Paul's uh, letter to the Philippians. He's just finished saying how contented he is, how he's learned to be content, whether he has a lot or whether he doesn't have very much, but we know the Philippians have sent him a gift to help him out, and this is what he says in verse 14, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, that is when they were a brand new church, when they'd just become Christians, he said, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, which is the next place he went after Philippi, he said, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now, uh, now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory. In Christ Jesus. Let's pray as we unpack this scripture and close out the book together. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that you've preserved it through the ages for us and that it speaks so loudly today. As we, as we so often pray, we pray, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And we're listening, Lord, with open ears and with open hearts and with open minds so that you can change what we know, change how we think, change how we feel about things so that we are in line with you and with your truth. Let that happen by your Holy Spirit speaking to us today in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. So last week we talked about the joy of living as we trust God for our contentment. Today I want to talk about the joy of giving. Now, don't leave. Don't leave uh, because uh, you, you think this is going to be a high pressure you know, push for money kind of sermon, and it's not. Uh, this is going to bless you, and I promise that. So don't, don't leave. Hang in there with me. We're going to talk about the joy of giving today. The title of today's message is The Joy Money Can't Buy. Now, the context here is that Paul is wrapping up his letters, uh, his letter to the Philippians. He's in prison in Rome. Paul is on lockdown. And if you think you know what a loss of your freedom is like, boy, he had a big loss of his freedom for a couple of years he was living, he was locked down in a house that he had to rent, but he could not leave. And, and uh, so he couldn't work. He was essentially imprisoned, but in a rented home. And, uh, and the, the Philippians found out about this, and they responded uh, with a gift. They sent a fellow named uh, Epaphroditus uh, to uh, minister to Paul. Now, Epaphroditus showed up, and he wasn't able to help Paul as much as he wanted. He got sick, but he also bought, brought a financial gift. To cover Paul's living expenses. And, uh, you know, some scholars even wonder, did, did Paul have to raise funds for his legal expenses because he was on trial for his life? In any case, this was a gift from the Philippians that they sent to bless him with. And it wasn't the first gift that they'd sent him. Uh, back when they were a brand new church, like, uh, like he says, uh, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, uh, they, had, uh, they had given, they'd, they'd started this history of generosity as a group of people, as a church. Um, it, it's, Paul said that he, more than once, when he was in need, when he was in Philippi, uh, the, or, or in Thessalonica, the people in Philippi sent him a financial gift. Now, that's a big deal because he wasn't in Thessalonica very long. Uh, we, we studied that book last year, and we found out Paul wasn't in Thessalonica very long. And if the Philippians, who were the last town he visited before he went to Thessalonica, if they found out he was in need in that place, and more than once, they sent him financial gifts to keep him going, like right after they even became a church. Uh, this is a history of generosity right from the outset in these people's lives. And so Paul's not here. He's not trying to coerce them. He's actually saying thank you to them. And then he wants to talk about the benefits of their lifestyle of generosity. So that's the way I hope we can approach it today, too. Uh, the joy of giving. And here we are, this is kind of our, 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 our point of reference. Because we're ref resting in God's provision for us, we can live with generosity. 
And what Paul's going to show us in this passage is that we find out that in generosity, it brings an increased potential for our joy as well. So let's look at some reasons to give with generosity. And the first of those reasons is this. We, we give because there's needs. I mean, that that's a, seems like an obvious one. For some people, that might not be. Uh, uh, for, for most of us, it's going to be like, oh yeah, there's a need. That's what tugs on your heart to give. God can meet our needs miraculously. Like, we know that. But he, he chooses to meet the needs of little children through their parents, through people, right? He, he chooses to, uh, to meet my needs, and he has met my needs miraculously. But so far, God has never dropped a sack of cash on my doorstep. Never happened. Um, he's met my needs oftentimes through other people. And he's used me to do the same thing. God often meets the needs of people through other people, through his hands and his feet, which is which is us. That's what the church is called, the body of Christ. The Philippians had regularly helped to meet Paul's needs. And, and that's a privilege that we have in our lives. Now, um, I heard an illustration in terms of meeting needs, uh, because sometimes it's irritating how many needs are out there. And I know, I know you can't meet them all. You really can't. And we're going to talk about that at the end, how to know what you're supposed to do. But I, I can't imagine any greater pain than for a parent to lose their child. Um, for one man, that experience in his life gave him a completely shifted perspective on the idea of meeting needs. Um, there, there was a man, I, I heard about him. He, he overheard someone complaining about charities and churches always asking for money. Uh, and, and you know what he said? He said, hey, can I tell you my story? He said, we had a little boy. He was the delight of our hearts. And, um, and he was always costing us something. Uh, we had to keep him in clothes. Oh, oh, you're always buying a kid new shoes. Uh, I had to feed him, and growing kids eat more and more. And, and, uh, and, and he said, whatever special thing he might have needed, you know, and we kept giving those things to him because we loved him and he was our child, and then we lost him. And he said, and he doesn't cost me a dollar now. And he put it this way. He said, every need is a sign of something that's alive. It's a sign of growth. Dead things won't bother you. So needs are actually good things to see. And God wants to use you, God wants to use me, to meet real needs in this world. And we can be a part of what God, what God is actually doing. And, and here's where our, our practical generosity, what we do with our financial lives, actually is an intersection of the physical world and the spiritual. And I want to keep that theme in front of you throughout this message because that's what we really want. If, if we want to have a spiritual life, if you want to be a spiritual person, what you really are saying is that you want the physical world that you're living in, the everyday, I can touch it, I can see it, I can smell it world that you're living in to intersect with the spiritual world. That you believe there's a spiritual reality and you want your life to, to connect with that. And that's what we do. We've talked about that in the past when, when we pray. When we pray, there's an intersection of, of the, the tangible physical world and what I'm doing, how I'm talking when I pray or when I write my prayers, whatever it is, a tangible physical thing that I do. And there's an intersection of that with the spiritual world. I, those, those two realms meet when I pray. I believe that my prayers actually have an effect in the spiritual world. And then that God can do something with my prayers and have an effect in my physical world. He can do stuff like that. And, 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 and so we live, as Christians, we live in people, uh, we live as people that really believe that our lives are intersecting with both of those very real realms. And by the way, our practical generosity is another way that my real world meets the spiritual world. They intersect. And we want this to go the other way too. How many people have said, you know, God has really blessed me, or I, I want God to bless me, or God, please bless me. And what they really mean is, God, will you take care of me in a, spirit, in, a, in a material sense, often a financial sense. We want that intersection to take place going one way, and, and the Bible teaches that it goes the other way as well. We're going to keep on that theme. I hope you keep it in mind. So we give, we give, because there's needs, and God wants to meet those needs through us. Second reason that we give, we give because it blesses us. Now, again, don't click away because I'm not a health and wealth prosperity gospel preacher. 
But I can't get away from this truth in the Bible that God wants to bless you. It's all over in the Bible. And Paul says it so here. He says, I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. This is not, by the way, it's a not, not a financial scorekeeping. You know, have you paid me back what, as much as what I gave you, Philippians? You know, um, is, is there this scorekeeping between Paul and the churches that he served in? It's not. It's, he's using financial language to describe a spiritual truth. Uh, Eugene Peterson puts it a really great way in his uh, tra- uh, translation, in his uh, paraphrase Bible, the message. And he says, not that I'm looking for handouts, but I do want you to experience the blessing that issues from generosity. Again, when we do tangible things as acts of faith, when I let my material world intersect with my spiritual beliefs, it results in spiritual growth and blessing. And God says he's going to keep pouring into our life so that we can keep on pouring out. And by the way, Jesus said so too. Jesus, the Son of God, said so too. He says in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Not like a bag of chips, where they put in the chips, and, and, uh, and before they settle, they seal that bag up, and so it's like three quarters full of air. No, 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 Jesus said, no, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a good measure. I'm going to press it down, I'm going to shake it up, so that it settles, and then it's going to run over. There's not going to be air in that bag. That's what I want to pour into your lap. He said, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to use. Now, Paul's not saying, I'm going to repay you, Philippians. He's saying, God will. God's promise is to pay you back. He wants to bless you. God will never let you look more generous than him. He's not going to do that. His reputation is at stake. He's not going to let that happen. But get this, and I've said this before. If you've been in, in, in our church, you've heard me say this before. It's so important for us to get this. And this is where we're not health and wealth prosperity preaching, okay? God is going to pay you back. But he gets to choose the currency. And he may pay you back in a different currency than you've given. And, and, you know, and we give in different ways. I can give mercy. I can show mercy and forgiveness to somebody. I can, I can give financially and materially. I can give in terms of my, ta- my time and my efforts and my talents that God is All of those things that God has given to me, invested in me. And I can give all those things and should give in all those different ways. And God can... God can repay us in any currency he he wants. He may not pay you back dollar for dollar, but he'll pay you back dollar for something. And if God pays you back in another currency than dollars, it will be in a way that dollars could never buy. He will pay you back in a way that as much, because we use our dollar, dollars are no good by themselves. We, we, We use them to buy things we need or want or want to feel or experience in our lives and he will pay you back in a way that your dollars might never be able to buy for you but you want desperately and this is what the bible says throughout the scriptures proverbs eleven twenty five says a generous person will prosper so many people hold back because they think i'm not going to prosper if i give too much away but the bible says a generous person will prosper whoever refreshes others will be refreshed proverbs nineteen seventeen. Wow, this is big. God says, he who's kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Well, God's not going to stay outstanding in his debts. He's not going to say, you owe me, God. He's kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward him for what he has done. That's not prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel tries to use God to get what you want. This is a totally different thing. This is about relationship. God wants to help me grow in my maturity. He wants to help you grow in your spiritual maturity and your life maturity and your financial maturity and in your relationship with him and generosity with my life and with my material blessings. Generosity helps me do that. It grows me in my maturity. It breaks the grip of greed in my life. It, it breaks the grip of fear in my life. And it helps my practical life and my spiritual life intersect. See, when I'm stingy toward God and stingy toward others, what I'm really saying with my life, my, my practical life is speaking more loudly than my words might be. When I'm stingy toward God, I'm really saying, I think God is stingy. 
I think God's going to hold out on me. I don't think he's going to give me what I really need. So I have to take care of me because he won't. And then I may get blessing, but I only get the blessing that I can get. I only get what I can get for myself, keep for myself, defend for myself, and not what God wants to give me. I miss out. I don't want you to miss out. I don't want to miss out. Do you want to grow spiritually? Do you want to experience blessing? Do you want to experience God in relationship and really know him at work in your life? Trust him on this. Uh, Paul, the same author, says in another book, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse, uh, verse 6 to 8, he says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. He's using an agricultural kind of analogy there. He says, you, you know, you, you only throw out a stingy bit of seed, you're not going to reap a whole lot. You want to grow a great garden? Throw out, throw out enough seed. And uh, he said, we'll reap generously. Each man should give. I love this part. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly. God doesn't want reluctance, not under compulsion. God doesn't want people to be coerced. You know, I, I mean, beware the slick talk that tries to coerce you or use guilt or manipulation or some kind of an emotional appeal to say, you know, you do need to do more than you're comfortable doing. No, God, each, each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful, or that is to say a joyful giver, somebody who's actually wanting to do this. And, and sometimes I don't want to, you know, as I write the check or as I press send on that e-transfer, whatever it is, it's like, ugh, this hurts, but, but there is joy in it. I, I, you know how that is. It's like it's both in the same moment. And, and, and God loves someone who can cheerfully say, I want to do this for you, God. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. It's not, it's not about coercion. It's not about coercion from God. And it's not about coercion from you either. That would be, you know, this transactional relationship where, you know, that, that's the prosperity gospel. Maybe I can, if I am generous enough, if I do enough, I can get God to do for me. And that's not what it's about. That's not relationship. This is about trust. And that brings us to our third reason for, for being generous. We give. We give because it brings pleasure to God. See, for a Christian, genuine generosity is not about gaining God's approval or twisting God's arm and getting him to do something for us. We don't have that kind of relationship with God. True Christianity doesn't have that kind of a relationship with God where we have to buy our way in or please him, you know, or... or you know, get, get him to like us or to appease him or to pay off our debt. Some people have this mindset, I've got to pay off my debt with God because he's given me so much. You can never pay off your debt with God. Because every, every good thing you do, he helps you do. You're just getting further in debt. See, God has done all of what we need through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. He's paid your debt. He's gained his approval. He's bought your way in. Your dues are paid. It's all done by Jesus on the cross. Our starting point is here. We are loved. Push it all out before you say this truth. We are loved. When we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are accepted. And because we're so secure, so accepted, so embraced, so loved, because we're God's children now, we're not trying to gain his approval. We're just trying to bring him pleasure. You see the difference? We just want to love him back. And so the Philippians gave a gift to Paul. And he reminds them that in reality, he, he says, yeah, you, you gave to me and I'm grateful for that gift. <coughs> but he says, in reality, you were always giving to God, which is why he, he said it was a fragrant offering, a pleasing sacrifice to God. A pleasing sacrifice brings pleasure to God. It smells good to him. See, when you, when you put the, your cash in the offering plate or when you donate to something that you know God cares about, it is not. I mean, we need to shift and get this, this mindset, this picture in our minds out. It's not about paying your club fees for services rendered to you. It's not chipping in for the show like you would for a busker on the street is primarily, this is number one, we are giving to God 
It's about worship. I give because there's needs. Yep, there's needs. There's bills to pay. You know, there's needs to meet. And I give because it brings a blessing to me, but primarily, primarily, I give because it's worship. It's why, why churches always take offerings in the middle of a worship service, because it's part of our worship. And, and this echoes what Paul said about Jesus in Ephesians 5.2. Paul writes this, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us. And what did love make him do? He loved us and he gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. He loved us and he loved his father and he gave himself up as a sacrifice for, for us to God. Love always reveals itself in sacrifice, in, in giving something up for the one I love. If you love somebody, you want to give them stuff. You want to give them yourself. You want, to, you want to spend yourself, and you want to spend your resources on them. It just, it, it overflows. We want to. That's what love does. God did it. And when we love him, because we know how much he loves us, we give. We give of ourselves. We give of our wealth. We give of our time. Because we are so loved, and we want to love back. It's not about gaining acceptance. It's about reflecting back what's already been given to us. And Jesus shows us this in the, in the story of the poor widow, that, this is, that giving is all about worship. In the, uh, the story of the poor widow, in Luke chapter 21, Jesus is at the, the temple, and he saw rich people tossing large financial gifts into the temple treasury, and he, and he wasn't impressed. He said, because you know what? They gave what they could spare. They gave a little portion. It was a big gift, but it was a tiny portion of the great wealth they had. It didn't cost them anything. He says, but she, she, she tossed in a couple of small coins, and he, and he says to his disciples, look at that. That's worship. She gave as a sacrifice. She gave a gift of love. It cost her. Because when you give a gift of love, it will mean you don't get some of what you want. <laughs> but that, and that's what makes it love. And, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. As a pastor, years ago, I asked the question because, you know, I was thinking about efficiency. Why does the church pays me? And then I take 10% of my pay and I give it right back. Like, shouldn't we just skip the middleman, cut my pay by 10% and call it good, right? Um, it's this is so circular until I, until I connected that I was leaving out this major truth, and that is, that's not the point. It's not just about meeting a need, paying the bills, or gaining a blessing, or, you know, or paying my dues. It's, this is for God's pleasure, and I don't want that taken away. I don't want that ability to worship God with my gift to be taken away from me. So I do it. I, you know, it's not done for me. I do it. And it's an act of worship. And I love it. I really do. And it's, and it's this place where the physical world, the practical world, intersects with the spiritual world. And I live out the belief I say I have. And that's what brings me to the fourth point, And that is this. So we bring... Beca uh, we give because there are needs. Uh, we give uh, because it blesses us. We give because it brings pleasure to God. It's an act of worship, and we want to please and bring, bring in pleasure. And then fourthly, we give because we believe. That's what Paul says, and my God will meet all your needs. And God has met all my needs. How about you? How about you? Has he met your needs? And the Apostle Paul says, and God will meet all your needs. He will. Count on it. You can take that to the bank. We give with the confidence that God will meet our needs. It, it is the real world intersection of faith and practicality. It's where what we say we believe meets with what we actually believe. And human nature is to say, well, when I, when I have more than enough, then I'll give. But God says, give. And watch, you'll have more than enough. In fact, in verse 19, Paul tells them that uh, as they have met needs, so God will meet their needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So when you give, you can think about it in these terms. Um, when, you, when you go to the bank for a loan, when you, you know, apply for a credit card, whatever, they, they, they want to know how much do you have and how much can you make. That'll determine how much we're willing to trust you with, you know? When you give to God, he says, I'm going to pay you back 
I'll take care of you. And if you were to say to him, well, God, how much do you have? Well, just the glory that is in Christ Jesus. I have that. How much can you make? Everything. I, he made stars, and he made the earth, and he made all the minerals that we mine out of the earth, and, and he made the trees that we cut down to sell as logs, and he made the animals that we slaughter and eat, and, and, and the stuff that we grow in our gardens and fields. He made all of that out of nothing. That's what I can make. Okay, you can pull down a pretty decent salary, God. Um, and, and what does he have? He has the riches of the glory of Jesus Christ, the, the Jesus who came to this earth and revealed God the Father, who lived a perfect life, who died on a cross, who was buried and rose from the dead and has ascended in glory to be with the Father. That glory, he's got that. That's on record. And he says, I'm going to pay you back according to all of that. That's going to be enough. So giving is an act of faith. And when we do it, we open ourselves up to God's provision. Uh, Andy Stanley, in his excellent uh, study series called If Money Talked, uh, says there's essentially five things you can do with your money. Uh, you can spend it. You can repay debts. You can pay your taxes. You can save your money or you can give it away. And most of us do those five things in exactly that order. Uh, I mean, the first four, now get this, the first four are really one thing. We can spend our money on me. So if I spend my money, I can spend it now, or I can pay off debt. I can pay off what I already spent on me, or I can pay my taxes. I can pay for what the government does for me, or I can save it. Yeah, that's to save it so that I can spend it later on me. And if there's anything left over after all that, I might think about giving some of that away. And Jesus said this. He, he said, uh, what you spend your money on reveals what you care about most. Uh, in Matthew 6, 21, he, he said, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And then later in that same passage, he invites us to completely flip our priorities. He says, I want you to Instead, instead of just spending on all of those categories that really are you, he said, I want you to put God first and learn to live on the rest. In Matthew 6, 33, he said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then all these things will be given to you as well. And Andy Stanley asks the question when we hear that, that God wants to flip our priorities to where we put God first and live on the rest instead of spend on me first and then I'll, I'll, I'll give on what might be left over. And he asked, what does that idea do inside of you? What is, what, what is that creation, uh, creating in you right, right now? For some people, there, there's a sense of relief that God will take care of me. But for a lot of people, if they haven't been living that way, God first, and then I'll live on the rest, it, it creates a great sense of anxiety, of resistance, of pushback. And Andy Stanley says, pay attention to the tension great piece of advice when it comes to learning something new. Pay attention to the tension because it's revealing what's really going on inside of you. Because many, many people don't give. They don't live generous lives because they don't think they have enough. And maybe they don't have enough because they don't give. I want you to think about that possibility. You see, because I've, I've talked to people who don't have much and who don't give much. And then some people who don't have much, and, and yet they give first, and, and then they talk about how the not having much seems better because they know that God is giving them what they need. And I've, I've talked to people who have more than I will ever dream of having, and yet they don't think they have enough. They're fearful. They're fearful. And they don't give. They're afraid to give. And then I've talked to people who have so much and then they give so much and they, they find out that they feel like they have so much more because of that generosity. This is where the spiritual intersects with the practical. And you've got a choice to make. You know, you can, you can take care of you and that's okay. Or you can put God first and let God also take care of you 
No, I want to live in that second category. I want my spiritual, I don't just want to live in the practical world. I want to live in a world where the spiritual intersects with the practical. I want to experience that, and you can. We want this. Most of us do want this, to know that there's someone else who's taking care of us too. It goes in both directions. It goes in both directions. So here's, here's the part where I'm going to tell you what I think you need to do today. And, I, and, and, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you what or how much to give. And I'm not going to tell you where to give. That's not my point today. Here's my point. This is the challenge for you today. Talk to God and tell him, God, I'm going to trust you on this. You have given me everything I have. Everything really belongs to you anyway, because you made it all out of nothing, including me. And I'm going to believe that you know what I need and that you want to take care of me. And so here's what I'm doing starting today. God, you get the first slice and you get to tell me where it goes. That's it. Now, I've got some thoughts and feelings on this. Um, I, I do. I believe in the tithe. I believe in, in 10% of, of my household income should be God's as a starting point. But I'm not going to tell you that you have to do that. You work that out with God, but figure it out. Talk to God and let him tell you what that number should be. If it's not 10%, ask God what number it should be. You figure it out. Go to him and ask him what percent. But whatever you and God settle, give that to him first. God, you get the slice off the top. And obviously a church has needs. But when it comes to where you give, let God have his say. Get it settled. and Don't just be a reactive giver. So many people are, are reactional givers, not proactive givers. They don't plan their giving. They just give out of whatever grabs their, their feelings. Because reactive uh, giving is just about what tugs on your heart. And we want our generosity, if we're going to intersect the spiritual and the material, we want our generosity to be a reflection of also what matters to God. Because I want to love what God loves. I want his priorities to be more and more my priorities. So, you know, reactive giving is just about what tugs on your heart. You see a picture of cute puppies, you hear sad music, and you say, take my money. And oftentimes, that's what people do. They, they, they give to what just grabs their heart with, without making a plan. And often, we, the, the giving that we see in our culture today, I'm going to suggest to you that so much of our giving is much more about signaling to other people that you're a good person, that you've got a heart. So you give to this you know, sexy project or whatever it is, and, and you, you get the sticker, or you get the fridge magnet, or you get the social media recognition, and that feels good. That's, that's giving for you. And the truth is sending money to keep a missionary working in some country overseas isn't going to get you as much of all of that. But it might be the thing that God loves. Here's the thing. You need to say, God, I love you. I trust you. What are you interested in? Because it's your smile that I'm seeking, not likes on my social media. And maybe God tells you to give regularly in dollars, in time, in your talents, in your abilities to some of the things that he loves. And he'll show you what those are. And maybe he says, Maybe he says, keep a little bit of your budget every month for something unexpected that I will show you. Maybe it's puppies. I, I don't know what it's going to be. But if you decide in advance, if you decide in advance what, what slice God gets, I'll guarantee you this, you will give more over time. It will surprise you how much more you give over time, but it won't hurt as much because you'll learn to live differently and you'll find that God makes it up to you and you don't miss it. So that's my challenge to you today. Let God talk and, and, and let God talk to you about this. And then do it. So let's pray. God, I'm going to trust you on this. You've given me everything I have. Everything really belongs to you anyway. I am going to believe that you know what I need. 
that you love me and want to take care of me and that you're not holding out on me. So here's what I'm going to do starting today. God, you get the first slice. Show me what that slice should be. And God, where do you want that slice to go? For your glory, through my life, may it bring a smile to you and blessing to me. And as you do that, would you receive this blessing? <clears throat> this is my prayer for you. May God make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, you will overflow with his good work. May your life be a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus.